Right, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Outstanding. Hey, um, I, I'm curious. What do you guys do to get ready for lecture? Open Zoom. Open Zoom. Okay, that's a good first step. I don't know. Is, is that the first step? Turn my choir. So open. What else? What else do you guys do to get ready for lecture besides open Zoom? Wake up. Is anybody on the West Coast? So what? In the West Coast, what is it? Um, eight in the morning. Eight in the morning right now. You didn't plan to sign up for an eight o'clock class, did you? No, I also didn't sign up for a five a.m. <laughs> class. Oh my God, you got one that's 5 a.m.? What, what class is that? Uh, occasionally your lab. Oh, you could switch to a different lab group. Yeah, just Tuesdays it overlaps <laughs> one day a week. Yeah, we, you could switch to a different lab and have it be, uh, it could be pretty informal. You could simply use a different lab. Um, uh, actually, that, that was one thing that came up. Somebody emailed me some questions about lab stuff. The best way to get questions about lab stuff answered is to post in the discussion forum here. I think I'm sharing my screen right now, right? So if you go to the discussions over here and there's, it says CAM questions, but just post any lab questions there. We've got PLAs that are monitoring that throughout the day, so they should respond quickly uh, if you post questions there. Um, emailing me the question may or may not work. I may not see the email until like two days later, and, and you probably wanted the answer more quickly. Somebody asked in the, uh, oh, okay, some of you have been responding, Red Bull, get out of bed, make sure that everything due is turned in. Um, somebody wants to know why I'll get out of bed. I mean, it's on Zoom. If you don't have the camera active, who cares? You guys don't even know if I have pants on. That was one of those jokes you're supposed to laugh at. You're wearing suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. I was shooting. I was I was shooting video, um, partly for this class, partly for some other stuff, and I was doing a whole bunch of videos all at once, and um, I wanted it to look like I didn't make all the videos at the same time. So I had brought a bunch of different shirts and ties and suspenders and stuff so I could change up my outfit. But since it only captures from here up, I was wearing sweatpants the whole time. So I have been known to walk around with sweatpants and suspenders just so that I can get the outfit going um, for the video, but not today. Today I actually have pants on. Does, it, does that um, work wearing sweatpants your suspenders? <laughs> I mean, it, the, the sweatpants purpose was to hold the, the right, it's about functional design. It's about what we were talking about on Tuesday. The function of the sweatpants was to hold the suspenders down. The, typically, the function of the suspenders is to hold the pants up, but that, that day, I mostly just wanted to display the suspenders. Um, style icon, somebody said. <laughs> I don't know about that, but um, belts don't work. My body's the wrong shape. If I, if I use a belt, my belly is bigger than my waist. And, and so if I use a belt, the pants just fall down anyway. The suspenders work. They hold my, my uh, pants up. Um, all right. So, um, so what else? What else do people do to get ready? Uh, tell my family to be quiet. Yeah. Um, did you just see my kids walk by? They're going outside to play in the rain. They get their raincoats on. They're all suited up. Um, so, um, so. I, uh, I, I do a few different things to get ready for lecture. One of the things I do is I try to remember what the lecture is about. And I use the syllabus for that. I don't know if anybody else in the class wants to check out what the lecture is going to be about before it starts. But I, I look at the syllabus and I think about what did we do last time and did I finish? Because um, I don't think these lectures are long enough. They should be you know, two, three hours long so that I could just keep talking. And, uh, and then maybe I would finish. But, uh, but I look at that, but I also I do some stuff to sort of wake myself up and to get the blood flowing. 
Um, anybody read the book Sapiens? Anybody? Not so it's a pretty cool book. Now yeah, it's a pretty cool book. It came out maybe a year or two ago, and um, and it it talks about human evolution, and it talks about the fact that when our brain was evolving, we had to walk about on average twelve miles a day to collect enough food to survive. And so if we if we were walking twelve miles a day, our brain was getting a lot more oxygen. If we sit at a desk all the time, we're not moving the blood as much. Our brain doesn't get as much oxygen. So I try to get up and move around, jump around. I know some people have in their office those mini trampolines just so they can jump on them to get to get the blood flowing and get worked up. So I do that. Um, does anybody listen to music to get psyched up? Anybody ever done that? Maybe maybe if you do some sports. Like when I, I used to uh, I used to do track and field in the uh, in the spring, in the fall I did cross country running. In the winter, I was skiing, and I know before a race, especially a sprint or a, or a ski race, I would always have to get my mind focused by listening to the right music, and uh, and so I listen to uh, I listen to music to get going, um, and and today I was actually singing because I don't know I was singing instead of listening to music. I do uh, I do a voice lesson with a with a guy to uh, partly to help me speak better. In moments like this so that i can articulate better and you can understand me better but uh, but a lot of it is also uh to uh because it's fun and I, I like to sing and stuff like that so i was i was singing a van morrison song to get ready for this class hey professor um, bergstrom um yeah a couple of students are wondering if you can go over assignments at the beginning of the class so students that have to go to another class don't miss any of the assignments part of the class um can you go over any of the assignments that okay early on in this? Um, any assignments that are due? Let's look at the thing here. Can you guys, you guys can't see the participant list that I'm moving around the shared screen, can you? No. Zoom hides the Zoom stuff, but uh, but it shows everything else. Okay, so you can't, because I get the chat window open and everything. I'm trying to be participative. Um, all right, what do we got? So discussion posts, a lot of you guys did that. I had actually meant to go create a, a graded discussion post for this. But, uh, but I'll go through and I'll, I'll figure out who responded, who did what. Um, but the question that I wanted you guys to talk about before we started class today was what is quality in manufacturing? Um, the next thing we're going to do, or so Friday the CAM1 assignment is due, that's posted in Canvas. Um, the discussion reply. What should the discussion reply be? I like this idea of having a discussion thing at the beginning of the week and a, and a reply at the end of the week. But what should what should we what should our discussion reply be about? I know the discussion reply is uh, hmm. maybe I can't. Go over this one. I think we'll have to wait till the end of the lecture before I decide what that's going to be. Um, the quiz will be posted by Friday. It'll be due on Sunday. Um, actually, let's have it due on Monday at midnight. Uh, and group assignment one, this is actually good. We should go over group assignment one. And, and we'll post this on, uh, we'll post group assignment one in Canvas when the lecture's over also. I'm going to stop the screen share so you guys can see what I'm writing on the board. So group assignment one. This is a very important primary objective to group assignment one. It is to have you form groups and have everybody get in the same group in the, um, in the groups page here. So if I go, I'm not sharing anymore. I hate this. It should know what I mean to do, and it should just do it. It shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to tell it. All right, now I'm sharing my screen again. So if you go to Canvas and you go over here to People, and I'm going to create a group set. Group set. Group set name. Um, somebody tell me a group set. That, wait, no, I know what it is. Group. 
right, the group set name is going to be group. Allow self sign up. Structure, create, I don't know how many groups. Limit groups to three members. I would like you to form groups of three people. You can use a discussion forum to find group members. If you already have friends that are in the class, you can be a group with your friends. You could um, figure it out. Uh, groups of three people. Um, there's about 60 people in the class. I think it's a little bit less than 60 people. So if I create 20 groups, 20 times three is 60. That should be enough. So 20 groups. And I don't care about leadership. Save. All right. So I have created groups now. There's 20 of them. Decide first who's going to be in your group. Then all of you log into Canvas and take the first group that's available. So if you're the first group to do this, you'll go to group one and the three of you will join group one. Don't go out and join a group if you haven't already decided who's in your group. So form the group, join the group, um, and then uh, I'm going to have a, there's a squeaky door that comes into the kitchen. You want to come on camera? No? Emily's being mean to you? You're bigger than she is. Just punch her in the nose. Oh, shoot. I'm not supposed to tell my kids to punch each other. All right. I don't think he's going to punch your sister in the nose anyway. Um, so, you're going to join the groups. Um, you're also going to have a group assignment. The group assignment, oh, I normally have you get together and physically meet. So that's going to be hard to do this term. But uh, the, the, the assignment that you're going to hand in, The assignment that you're going to hand in as you uh, as you form your group here um, is going to be a you could all do a Zoom call, right? And you could record the Zoom call. All right, so everybody get in a Zoom call, get on camera, record the Zoom call. However, it is you record the Zoom call and make a video that says why you took M1800. And uh, and three things that your group collectively wants to learn in ME 1800. Now, I don't want to have a 20 minute long Zoom call recorded. So make a no longer than 45 second video, but you may have to talk longer than 45 seconds in your group to, to come up with your, your three things that you want to learn. So this is the three things the group wants to learn, not three things each individual person wants to learn. Um, and just uh, group decide why you took M1800 and then post that, make a 45 second video and there'll be an upload in the assignments page where you can upload your video. Okay, um, so that's group assignment number one. Uh, the details, I've got a written up document about this, so I'll update that for this term to get that posted too. Uh, the quiz is gonna be due uh, Sunday, it'll be posted on Friday. And I think that's it. All right. Does that help? And there'll be a discussion reply. Uh, I'll, I'll post that also. But I think I want to finish today before we decide what the discussion reply is going to be. When um, do we do the second reply? Uh, when should the group assignment be due? Oh, uh, by next Wednesday. To have that video up by next Wednesday. That's not fair. Does more than does everyone have to submit it or just one group member? Uh, it'll be a group assignment, so one person in the group can submit it and it will get graded to everybody that's in the group. But it will only get the grade will only apply to people that are actually actually enrolled in the group. So before you submit it, make sure all three people are enrolled in the group. Come here, Emily. Yeah. Please. You no, you don't want to help me? Three people in a group? Yes. I don't want more than three people in a group. If if the math is impossible to have three people in every group, so if the total number of students in the class is not divisible by three, then I will make individual exceptions up to two of them. Um, but yeah, groups of four, then there's always somebody that never does any work. Professor Bergstrom. Three, everybody can create. Yeah. Groups, Can you put a list two, of what you want in the video somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, I have that all written up, so I'll post that.
On okay. a completely different note, can we see your kids sometime? <laughs> I tried just now. I invited both of them to come on camera. Um, actually, you know what though? You can, because I'm recording today's lecture from another angle and they totally have walked through. So I'll, I'll get some clips of that. I'm, I'm doing a, uh, I'm, I'm making a making of video for M1800 lectures on a different, uh, on a different set. All right. Um, okay. Groups, groups are created. You're going to join a group. You're going to post your video. All right, that sounds good. Uh, what, what are we talking about today? Quality and metrology. Quality and metrology, that's the title, right? Um, and you guys, you guys posted about what is the meaning of quality in manufacturing. What, do you, what, what does it mean to have quality in a manufacturing setting? Somebody, I could, I could go through, I could read some of these off, but somebody volunteer, what does it mean? Anybody? We, quality is important, right? Adherence to specifications. Say it again. Adherence to specifications. So you get can't see what I'm writing on the board, but that's okay. I'll turn that on in a minute. So, so you said adherence to specifications. Um, I want to share a quick video with you guys. Wait, can you hear the sound? Do I need to stop sharing and reshare with the sound on? Screen share, share computer sound, share. All right, now you guys can hear the sound on the video. Okay. All right, play. Every sports sedan is supposed to do well in the fast lane. But what about these lanes? At Lexus. We've achieved extremely tight tolerances between all major body panels. So not only does the ES300 look like it's put together well, it actually is put together well. I learned from experience that if I don't exit the YouTube there, it keeps playing stuff in the background. So, what is quality in manufacturing? Hey, could you guys yell at each other after my class is over? What is quality in manufacturing? Well, there's like a lot of different standards you could look at. Um, like you get like tolerances for one of them, just like a pass or fail on that, that aspect. All right, so, uh, so in, in, in the video we watched, they talked about tolerances, right? So what are tolerances? We talked about it in class already. What are tolerances? The limits that something can be acceptable. So limits Give me an example of a tolerance. Like uh, an outer diameter of half an inch or plus or minus like five thou or something how about if we did a an outer diameter of 0.860 inches so this this piece is supposed to have an outer di actually it's supposed to have an outer diameter of 0 0.860 0 0.860 inches 
that's actually the nominal diameter of the cylinder. And so we talked about how these, these engines function, right? And we talked about the fact that the, uh, the piston has to fit inside the cylinder. So what would happen if the cylinder is 0 0.860 and the piston is 0 0.860? It would probably be too tight. It won't fit. It probably won't fit, right? You uh, you may get it in there, but you're gonna have to jam it in there. And if, if that's the case, then it won't it won't slide back and forth easily. So so that would be a problem. Oh, hi Emily, you want to join the meeting? Join the class? Hey, this is Emily. Hey Emily. Hi, Emily. Hi, Emily. They're all how are you? Hi. <laughs> they want to know how you are. How are you? Good. You're good? Okay. She can't hear you because you're in my ear. But uh, that's Emily. This she is has the, very pretty uh, hair. You have very pretty hair, they said. This is the rest of the zoo studio. In case you're wondering, it is in my kitchen. Check out the wallpaper. The brick kind of looks like it could be part of WPI for a little bit. <laughs> it, it kind of looks like that, um, but it's actually just the back side of the chimney for our fireplace. All right, I think I've got that back went in the right direction again. Um, there always was a whiteboard here, but it used to be lower down the wall. It was the whiteboard for the kids to write on. Uh, all right, so um, so the tolerances are how much the designer is willing to let the uh, the manufacturing people screw up. So the design size, the design size has to be smaller for the piston than it is for the cylinder. And it turns out we've done some experimenting, and uh, and if it's about eight ten thousandths of an inch smaller. Than the uh, than the cylinder, the engine runs pretty good. So, eight ten thousandths. That's point eight five nine two. Something in that range should work pretty good. But oh, you're helping. You love something. Cats. 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 You love cats. Excellent. Love cats so Emily, too. I've recruited Emily to help with Me an experiment too. that we're going to do next. But uh, all right, can I finish my class? Otherwise, it's going to take too long. And all right, so so tolerances. So we're not going to make all of them exactly 0.8592. And in fact, we're not going to make all of the cylinders exactly 0.860. So the tolerance is how much the designer is willing to let us mess up when we're making the parts. And so the specification we have on the drawing that we use for the cylinder part, it actually is 860 plus or minus 0 0.001. So one thousandth of an inch when we make these cylinders. Now, the ones we put in the kits and we shipped to you, we made them to a tighter spec than that. I'm kind of doing a live lecture right now. Well, go, go complain to your mother. And I'm doing a live class. Okay. So you've got plenty of time to interact with my kids today. Um, so the tolerance that we used, and, and part of the reason we use that tolerance for making these cylinders, so how do you know when you have quality? Actually, let's 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 back up. Let's let's forget about the cylinders for right now. How do you know when we have quality? I'm gonna go to the PowerPoint. I'm gonna present, and I'm gonna share the screen. All right. So, how do you know when you have quality? Is is the question we're gonna be asking here. Which car manufacturer has the highest quality out of these three? I need to go to participants. Let's make 
can I can I create a poll? Add a question. Add a question. I've never done this before. Uh, answer one. GM. Answer two. Kia. Answer three. All right. Um, all right. I am done. Um, question. Never used the poll feature here. Um, now, how do I say I'm done safe? All right. Can you guys see the poll? Launch polling. Now you can see it. All right. So which car maker, when we do this in the classroom, I have you guys all stand up and I have all the Mercedes people stand over here and I have all the GM people stand over here and I have all the Kia people stand in the middle. So I don't know if I should discuss the poll results as you're voting, it may influence the voting. But Mercedes is, uh, is at 88%. He is at 12% and nobody has voted for GM, like zero. Oh, somebody give him a sympathy vote or something. Zero people voting for GM. So the, the Germans and uh, where's Kia made? Is that Korea? Yes, yeah, Korean. Yeah, Japan. Korean. I think I think Kia is Korean. Oh, somebody, two people voted for GM. Sweet. Kitty votes. I used to have a GMC Acadia. And um, I don't know if anybody in the classroom has ever had an Acadia. They look really nice. It was kind of cool to look at. I, I chose it because of all of the SUVs that had third row seating that we checked. It had the most leg room in the third row. I don't know why that was my criteria because I never intended to sit in the third row, but it was my criteria. And the only reason I didn't have a minivan was because nobody at the time manufactured a minivan that had the towing capacity to tow my boat, which while I owned the Acadia, I moved the boat two times. So I probably could have just rented a pickup truck those days. But anyway, so I get 81%, 76% of you have voted, 36 out of 47 people, come on, are the rest of you guys asleep? That's the person who said, why are you guys getting out of bed to go to class? That person's asleep, huh? 36, I don't know. All right, so Mercedes wins in a landslide, huh? Mercedes gets 81, can you guys see the poll results? So Mercedes got 81% of the vote. GM gets 6%, Kia gets 14%. Um, I'm gonna go back to my presentation. That's not my presentation. But from here. So here we were. I'm still sharing my screen, right? You still? All right. I'm going to have to make a quick change. My Bluetooth battery is dying. Put you on the speaker. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yep. All right, perfect. Yeah, I had to, my, uh, my little Bluetooth thing died and, uh, and I tried to switch to the speaker on my phone, but uh, I hung up the phone call instead. So, uh, so now we've got computer audio. Uh, it tends to be a little bit laggy sometimes, so I hope it comes out okay. But so you guys voted 81%. 
for Mercedes. 6%, I think it was six. Anyway, you voted overwhelming for Mercedes. If I could only get the right screen back, okay. Why? Why did you guys vote overwhelmingly for Mercedes on quality? 81% of you. Well, it's I would say expensive. I voted for... It's a luxury car? It's a luxury car, I will agree. It uh, has a higher performance than the rest of them on average, but I say I would say if you put a Toyota or a Honda in there, you might have some debate uh, oh, versus dude, my, performance or my uh, longevity. The, my choices for the poll were strategic. I, and um, I suppose I could have put a Toyota in, and if I'd put a Toyota in um, on the participant thing, say yes if you would have voted for Toyota instead of whichever one you voted for. So 18, 19, a significant number of you would have voted for Toyota instead of the one you voted for if I, uh, if I had offered that. Uh, my, my choice was actually kind of strategic here. Um, and it's because I had this, this graph from 2017 from JD Power that, that said that Kia out of those three had the highest quality. GM was somewhere in the middle and Mercedes was last. What defines the quality? Exactly. So does anybody see what the, uh, what the study here was about? This JD Power study? They were using problems per vehicle. It was per hundred vehicle, how many problems were reported back to the dealer that the dealer bothered to keep track of, right? So if I reported something I didn't like about it and the dealer didn't record it, that would get missed. Um, and, and I, so, so one thing that this tells me, but people will make purchase decisions based on reading the results of this study, right? Or, or people will at least use the results of this study to justify a first purchase decision that they may have made. You guys see that? Is that true? Right. That'll happen. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of think that the study might be biased. Um, I think it might be biased against the expensive car, because I think that people that paid $150,000 for that Mercedes might be more likely to complain if something was wrong. Do um, you think that it could also be because the manufacturers like marked that there were errors because they cared more? It might be that the Mercedes dealer was recording more of the input. I don't know, um, but, but quality depends, right? Quality depends on what we're trying to measure. And it depends on the context that we're talking about quality. So, so quality as defined by the ASQ, the American Society for Quality, and they offer professional certification certifications. Um, there's knowledge, there's a whole bunch of stuff on their website. They, they say that quality is a subjective term for which each person or sector has its own definition. In technical usage, quality can have two meanings. The characteristics of a product or service that bear on its ability to satisfy stated or implied needs. And that's actually exactly what the International Standards Organization, ISO, defines quality as. And they also say that, that quality could mean a product that's free of defects. Now, if quality can mean many different things and even the American Society of Quality, they even say that, well, it depends. How could we possibly make a definition for what does quality mean in manufacturing? You just have to specify, specify what you care about. So you have to specify what you care about, okay? So if we're gonna define quality, We have to specify what we care about. 
So what do we care about in manufacturing? Somebody said earlier that we care about meeting the tolerances, right? Somebody said we cared about adhering to specifications. I would say on, on every specification, there is a tolerance. The tolerance is how much we're allowed to mess up in our adhering to specifications. So how do we know in as a manufacturing engineer, do I want to ship low quality stuff to my customers? No. Oh. No. So we don't want to ship low quality to our customers. How do we know we're shipping the highest quality to our customers that we can? Or how do we how do we know that we have the quality even to ship it to the customer? You inspect it. We have to do inspection. Does quality inspection does quality inspection add value to the parts that we're selling to the customer? Yeah, because yeah. adding work will add value. Let me go back to the manage participants. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Manage participants. I'm going to clear. Say yes or no. Does quality inspection add value to the part that we're shipping to the customer? I got four people that said no. So Ben Ward, you said no. Why not? I think um, it it might add value to um, the process for the customer, but it doesn't directly add value to the part. So you think it may add value to the process, but not to the part. Who else said no? Brian, you said no. Uh, yeah, I have a similar answer, like um, in terms of value added and non-value added um, okay, processes. You, you said no. What'd you say? Uh, Caitlin also said no. Does Why did you say no? I'm picking on the people that said no because there's fewer of them. There's only six of you. Noah, why did you say no? It doesn't necessarily add value to the product because you don't really know whether or not it's it's actually working or not. <laughs> All right, I think you got it. I think you got it. Um, what what is value to the customer? A working part. A working part. The customer wants what the customer what the customer wants. They don't want us to inspect it. They just want to have it, right? I, yeah, I, I look at this. Yeah, it's going to work. So, so, so they don't want to have a bad part. No, don't, don't get me wrong. They're willing to let us inspect it because they don't want to receive a bad part. But, but they don't care about the inspection process. They care about receiving a good part. And, and a good part in it for manufacturing is the part the customer asked for. And if you give the customer the part they asked for, you have delivered quality. Whether or not they asked for, uh, so like with the, the case of Mercedes, right? We said, we said Mercedes is the highest quality automobile. I would agree that it's the most expensive one on that list. I would agree that it's, the um, probably the most luxurious one on that list. And I did also pick, you know, the $150,000 Mercedes to put in my picture. Um, and that is quality for the customer that wants that. But for the customer that just wants a simple cheap car to get back and forth to work in, then the Kia probably is higher quality because it's a, a simple cheap way to get back and forth to work. So quality in manufacturing is giving the customer what they need when they need it. 
You can deliver perfect parts to the customer, but if you deliver it to them three weeks after they could possibly use them, there's no quality to the customer there. So delivering quality in manufacturing means giving the customer what they need when they need it. Okay. So we can, def and in fact, for the sake of this class, we have now defined what is quality in manufacturing, right? So that's perfect. So how do we know if we have that quality then? I, I do think there are cases where inspections definitely add value, like to a car yeah. company. There are, there's if, one case when inspection adds value to the part. It's when the customer is willing to pay for the inspection report. Well, I was thinking more like for in lawsuit cases, like if a comp if, if I buy airbags for my cars and they're certified inspected and then lawsuits happen, there is value in that I don't have to pay them. You said the magic word certified. Sure. Right. If, if people were willing to buy uncertified airbags for their car and you gave them airbags that maybe work, maybe don't work, then you've delivered to them what they, what they requested and you still win the lawsuit. So, so I, I agree in the case where the customer is willing to pay extra, we have a panda joining the lecture, but the customer is willing to pay extra for the inspection report, quality adds value. Now, does that mean we don't need to do quality inspection if the customer is not willing to pay for it? And that would depend on like the status of federal regulations and stuff that might require them. There, there may be federal regulations that require inspection. Ooh, that's something nobody's ever brought up before. I would have to think on that before I respond because you may have you may have a point there. It may also no. Well, yeah, because in certain if states, the federal maybe... regulation specifically requires the inspection, then it adds value to the part. And if the customer has ordered a part that meets the federal specification, then the customer has asked you to do the inspection. So I, I stand by my answer that it's only adds value to the part when the customer is willing to pay for it, but we still have to do it because we don't want to ship crap to the customer, right? But if we can reduce the time it takes to do the inspection, if we can reduce the cost, so, so quality inspection adds cost to the process. It doesn't add value to the process, except for the case where we have to do it because of the customer requirement. It doesn't mean we shouldn't measure our parts, right? But if we can do a, a process that we call process control, so if we can measure in process parts instead of finished parts, and if we can know that all of the in process measurements are gonna make it so that we have good parts at the end, then that adds, it adds quality. I, somebody said at the beginning, it adds quality to the process, right? And I agree that it totally can add quality to the process if, we, um, if we're doing it and it makes our process better. That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it makes the, the part better. All right, so the thing I was trying to get you all to say um, when I asked the question, what does, uh, how do we know when we have quality? is going to be that we have to measure something, right? And it's it's sort of half the title of today's lecture is quality and metrology. And so this is always, this was designed to be a two-part lecture. So I want to introduce the idea of measurement. So don't don't be thinking that this is not a quality lecture because I, I talk too much about the first half of the title. But um, anybody know, say it. So does anyone know who said these things? To measure is to know. If you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And when you can, anybody know who said these things? Real famous guy. A scale of measurement was named after this guy. Dr. Fauci. <laughs> he may have repeated Kelvin? it. It was Lord Kelvin. Now, 
he also said x-rays will prove to be a hoax. So I'm not certain that everything Lord Kelvin told us was true. But uh, you, can't, you can't control any process if you can't measure it. You can't know if you've, re if you've achieved a goal if you can't demonstrate it with measurement. So, so measurement is extremely important to us in manufacturing and our ability to measure things. Um, I'm going to end on this thought right here, but uh, I said when we make the cylinders, I'm going to stop sharing so you guys can see me. When we make these cylinders here, I said the tolerance that we put on this is plus or minus one thousandth of an inch. And, and the reason we use that tolerance is because we want to be able to control our manufacturing process and we want you guys to be able to set up and run the machine to make them. And with plus or minus one thousandth of an inch, I can tell if I have a good part, if the green side goes in and the red side doesn't. And so this is called a go no go gauge. And we've got this gauge for these cylinders. And so this is a good cylinder because I can put the green side in, I can't put the red side in. And so that's a very quick way that when the part comes off the machine, we can tell is this a good part or not. Now it's not the only critical dimension on here. We also want to measure, did I mention I don't want you to shove broken glass into your hand when you assemble these things? No, but I figured that was implied. Okay, I think I tried, I tried to mention that last time. <clears throat> the thing that causes the glass to break when you're trying to assemble them is the depth of these grooves, these O-ring grooves here. And so, so the other thing we measure when we take these off the machine is we measure the depth of the O-ring groove. And we can do that with our calipers. You guys got a cal set of calipers in your set. And so it's, um, so the depth here is supposed to be 754. And I, uh, I don't have the drawing in front of me, but the tolerance is like plus or minus two or three thousandths. Maybe it was one and a half thousandths. Um, and so we can measure that depth of the O-ring groove. Now, if we get the depth of the O-ring groove correct and we put the correct O-ring on it and the, the test tube that we put on has the right diameter, then you can slide those on. They don't shatter when you're trying to slide them on. You don't end up with glass in your hand. Again, this is a bad week to go to the emergency room. So be careful if you're doing that. Um, next week in class, um, I'm hoping, so Tuesday in class, I'm hoping that you guys will have received your kits and that you'll have your calipers available and that you'll have your pistons available so that we can do some measurements on the pistons. And, uh, and we're gonna give you an assignment to do some measurements next week and, and report those back. What, uh, what can go wrong as we're measuring? Uh, your calipers aren't zeroed. So we could fail to have our calipers zeroed. So we're gonna talk about that as we get to class next week. What else could go wrong? We're gonna try to measure this outside diameter here. And I hold my calipers like this. I can get an outside diameter. What if I hold them crooked like that? It'll be larger than it should be. You'll get It'll be larger, larger than it should be. What if, um, I don't know if there's any, what if I have really good hand strength? And so when we open and close these, there's this, this we slide them like this, right? What if I push really hard? It could get off the track. Uh, well, you could, if you push hard enough, you could just break the whole thing. That would, that would suck. Depending um, but if on the I material, push really hard, just... when, when you apply a force to anything, it deflects, it bends. So if I push too hard, I could actually bend the jaws out a little bit. And then my measurement would be too small. So there's technique to using all these measurement tools. Um, we sent you these calipers at, I don't know what, I don't know what our final price was. We tried to negotiate a price, but these are 20, 30 bucks each. We sent you these calipers. What we didn't do was send you a $300 digital micrometer or 
the $200 bore mic. Um, so we're going to have to, you're going to have to take some things on faith. I'm going to measure some things and tell you what they are. I think uh, in your kit, you also got a measurement report. And so in this case, I was assuming the customer was willing to pay for the, uh, for the measurements. So I included the measurement certificate in there. Certificate. Yeah, that's a strong term, but the measurement report. So I measured all of your cylinders and I measured all of your pistons and, uh, and you've got three different sizes of piston in there. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to see if you can, with the calipers, decide which one is which. Uh, because we get more resolution with the micrometer than we do with the calipers. Um, and we're going to do some of that stuff. Somebody asked a question in the chat that I think I need to reply to. All the birds were killed in 1986 due to Reagan killing them and replacing them with spies who are now watching us. Huh, I did not know that. That's pretty cool. The more you know. Learn something new every day. Yes, sir. Um, but that wasn't the thing that I was looking for in the chat. I saw it go by in the chat. Uh, quarantined the birds. X-rays are about as real as birds in the sky. Huh. Mercedes also got 10 times the number of parts and systems. So yeah, they could fail quicker. I agree. Um, oh, this was the one. It was Caitlin. What's happening with the discussion? Should we be waiting for an official thread to post? Uh, I had intended to make an official thread so that it could be easy for me to grade, but no, don't wait for that. Just reply in the in the post that's going on there. And then our- uh, Why are we replying? Oh, so the, the question was, yeah, never mind. We'll forget about the, uh, the first question because the first question was what is uh, quality of manufacturing? And I wanted you to answer that before we talked about it in class. Hmm. What's our discussion reply though? The thing that we have to do. Yeah, now. yeah, that's that's my question. I said I wanted to say it at the end of class because I wasn't sure what I wanted it to be. Um, we're gonna start a new thread instead of having it be a reply. I'm gonna start a new thread, and um, I want to do it a little bit different it's uh what's the uh what's the hardest part about class doing classes online from home and what's the best part about it so what's what's the worst thing about it what's the best thing about it and and uh if if there's something i can do about the worst things maybe we can adjust the class a little bit so what's what's wrong with doing this with classes from home and what's good about doing classes from home. How's that? When will the discussion thread be posted and when will it be due? Um, let's have it due on Sunday and I'm posting it right now. I'm just logging in. Awesome. Thank you. So that I don't forget. Canvas, ME1800, nope, that's the wrong one. That's the A-term one. This term's ME1800, it would be, they, they would probably hate it if I started giving them assignments again, huh? Dis Most definitely. Discussion, add one. Um, what's the problem? with this term, but good. I can't spell W H A T. All right, so this is a I'm sure that threaded replies users and I don't care if you post first available until where's the where's the button I click that says this is a graded nope oh, there it is this is a graded discussion uh, 
over 10 points, class discussion, no peer reviews due um, Sunday. Save and publish. Okay, that's up there. All right, and so the, the first one from this week, we won't grade that, but uh, but thank you for the 17 of you that replied to it or, or posted it in there. <clears throat> and I think we're good then. The quiz will be up tomorrow. And all right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And how was Thanks. the audio? Did it work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No problems. Outstanding. Thanks.